Good evening. For those of you who don't know me, and since I have been around for so long, I don't think that's too many of you, I'm Pastor Paul Shawe. I serve at St. John's here on the west side of Bay City. And by the way, I also serve as your circuit pastor. So another good reason for me to be out here is to check up on you guys. We gather this evening on this Wednesday of the sixth and last midweek Lenten service as we continue our spiritual journey with our Savior to his cross and as we also look at one more crossword. Now maybe if you looked in the bulletin you, you will come across what that crossword is. I'm not going to give it away right now. The service that will follow is printed in the bulletin for you once again, and we're going to begin by singing the hymn, I Lay My Sins on Jesus. Please stand. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. Let your light scatter the darkness. We confess our sins. Father, I have sinned against you and am no longer worthy to be called your child. Yet in mercy you sacrificed your only son to purge away my guilt. For his sake, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And in the joy of the Holy Spirit, let me serve you all my days. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Upon this, your confession, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we pray. O oh God, our Father, by your mercy and might, this world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unresolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love knowing that you alone are our sure defender through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please be seated. And the psalm of the day is Psalm 38, which is printed in the bulletin. We will sing it together. Lord Jesus, my sin is more than I can bear. Thank you for bearing it for me when you suffered its consequences on the cross. Lead me 
whenever I offend God's law to confess my guilt to you, then intercede for me with our Father in heaven so that my many sins are forgiven. The Passion History of Our Lord Jesus, according to the Gospel of St. Matthew. This evening we read chapter 27, verses 27 through 66, the account of how Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out to the city, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon. They forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. They offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. After they had crucified him, they divided his clothing among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down and were keeping watch over him there. Above his head, they posted the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. At the same time, two criminals were crucified with him one on his right and one on his left. People who passed by kept insulting him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest, experts in the law, and elders kept mocking him. They said, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him. Because he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him kept insulting him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, this fellow is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran, took a sponge, and soaked it with sour wine. Then he put it on a stick and gave him a drink. The rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. After Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks were split. Tombs were opened and many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised to life. Those who came out of the tombs went into the holy city after Jesus' resurrection and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus with him saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they were terrified and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. 
many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and who had served him were there watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb that he had cut in the rock. He rolled a large stone over the tomb's entrance and left. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered in the presence of Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that deceiver said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. So give a command that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might steal his body and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and posting a guard. This is the gospel of the Lord. We will now continue by singing the hymn, A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to be up there, right? Oh, sure, I'm talking about heaven, but actually I'm especially talking about our daily life. For example, someone else gets promoted to that manager position at work. You feel that one doesn't deserve it. While you, because of your hard work, do. You want to be up there in that top spot with all the prestige and salary boost that comes with it. Or you're coming to the checkout line at Myers or some other store, and you want to be up there, right? Up in the front of the line and avoid the waiting game. That seems to be such a natural attitude we have, right? An attitude we assume is natural and right. And yet, our Lenten focus is on one who should be up there, who should always be on top and always out in front The thing is, he had a totally different, and from our viewpoint, an abnormal attitude. It's an attitude that is summed up in one word, a larger word that is significant in connection with the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus. So let's get to tonight's crossword. It's an 11-letter word, That means lowliness. And the concept is found in these words of Isaiah. Chapter 53, verses 2 through 4. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root from dry ground. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a a man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering. Like someone whom people cannot bear to look at, he was despised and we thought nothing of him. Surely he was taking up our weaknesses and he was carrying our sufferings We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. The word of the Lord. Now, I suppose you have figured out by this point in this season of Lent that the majority of the readings of this series come from the book of Isaiah, particularly Chapter 53, there is no clearer, more detailed description in the Old Testament of how the work of the Lord's servant, that promised Messiah to save people from their sins, would include his suffering and death. This chapter should make it easy for anyone to identify who the suffering Savior was. And yet, despite how clear and precise these details are, Isaiah also predicts in the opening verses of this chapter how people, how the uh, Messiah Savior would be rejected. By people. Isaiah, in our reading, lists three reasons for this rejection. One, because of his obscure upbringing. Two, because of his apparently worthless life. And three, 
because of the mistaken assumption about his suffering and death. The words, he grew up like a tender shoot and like a root from dry ground, echo the words of Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will spring up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. A shoot is a small growth coming from a dead stump, and it, like a root in dry ground, will amount to nothing. King David's, the, the royal tree of King David's family had been cut down with is uh, Judah's rejection of the Lord leading to the Babylonian captivity and only a stump remained. Think about this. Joseph, a direct descendant of King David, should have been king of Israel. Instead, he was a lowly carpenter. Mary, another descendant of David, should have been a princess in the royal court. Instead, she was a lowly handmaiden. Jesus should have been raised as royalty. Indeed, as true God, he should have been treated as royalty by all. Instead, he was raised in the little hick town of Nazareth. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. In other words, Jesus was just another face in the crowd. This obscure upbringing led people to conclude he will amount to nothing. And they rejected him. What a humble upbringing. Isaiah goes on to describe how the Lord's servant would be a man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering. Jesus once stated, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Think about it. What do you do when you see homeless people? We tend to ignore them, right? The sight of them disturbs us. We worry that they might come to us asking for help from us. But most of all, we value them as worthless to our society. Like someone whom people cannot bear to look at, he was despised and we thought nothing of him. To people, homeless Jesus was apparently worthless. To the Jewish religious leaders, Jesus' teaching was apparently worthless because it conflicted with their own teachings. And they rejected him. What a humble life. In the last verse of our reading, Isaiah points out the reality of the Messiah's suffering and death in contrast to the assumption. The reality is, Surely he was taking up our weaknesses and he was carrying our sufferings. The assumption was we thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. The Jewish leaders found Jesus deserving of death for blasphemy, for claiming to be the Christ this promised Messiah, the Son of the living God. People looked at Jesus hanging on the cross and assumed 
God must be punishing him for his sins. And they rejected him. What a humbling suffering and death. Now, you've heard a number of times during this look at Isaiah's words, the word humble. And that brings us to this evening's crossword. The 11-letter word that means lowliness is humiliation. Certainly, Jesus' humiliation matches Isaiah's prediction of the Messiah's servant's humiliation. Now, usually when we talk about humiliation, we're talking about how some others embarrass us, shame us, cut us down, and make us feel lowly. However, here, people's rejection was not the reason for Jesus' humiliation. This was God the Father's will. His plan that his son, his appointed suffering Savior, humble himself to save sinful people. And Jesus willingly humbled himself to save sinful people. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed, but he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Think of Jesus' humiliation like this. True God became true man. The ruling God became a servant for people. The holy God took upon himself the guilt of all people. The living God suffered and died for the sins of all people. Look at Jesus on that cross. Yes, God was punishing him but not for his sins because he didn't commit any. God was punishing him for the sins of you and me and all people to rescue us from the punishment we really deserve, to lift us up as God's children with the forgiveness of sins that he has won for us and to give us eternal life in his heaven. And so Jesus' humiliation is a key component to God's plan to save you. This season of Lent calls for us to humble ourselves and repent because we have not obeyed God's will in our lives because we have not lived up to God's standard of perfection because we do not deserve to be exalted by God but rather to suffer humiliating punishment from God. There is a warning here. When you think that you are a pretty good person compared to others, you're not humbling yourself. You are rejecting Jesus. If you think, or when you think, that there are only certain times when you need Jesus in your life, and that's not all that often. You're not humbling yourself. 
you are rejecting your Savior. When you think that being religious or spiritual only means living a life that doesn't hurt others and believing that there is some kind of God out there, you are not humbling yourself. You are rejecting the true God of salvation. Don't let Jesus' humiliation cause you to join those who reject him because of his lowliness. Rather, thank Jesus for his humble, serving attitude for you. Worship him for it. Hold on to him by faith for his willingness to go to the depths to save you. And let his humiliation move you to be humble in your attitude, in your words, and in your living, knowing by faith that you are lifted up as an eternal child of God, not because of you or because of what you have done, but because Jesus has done it all for you. Yes, humiliation is our crossword and is an important concept in our faith because it was Jesus' saving attitude toward you. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated as we give our thank offerings to the Lord. Please stand. O Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, who suffered the anguish and death of the cross to win forgiveness for our sins and eternal life, we humbly thank you for giving yourself for us. It is with both sadness and joy that we view your suffering and death. Deep sorrow fills our hearts because we know it was our sins that brought you to the cross. 
our sins were so many and so great that nothing less than your holy, precious blood could atone for them. Had we and our first parents not sinned, your bloody and painful sacrifice would have been unnecessary. And yet, great joy also fills our hearts, dear Savior, for your suffering and death are evidence of the great love our kind and merciful God has toward us. God loved us and sent you, his Son, to satisfy divine judge, justice for our sins as we commemorate the sacrifice you made, your body and blood given and shed for us. This is our sorrow that we are great sinners, but this is our great joy that God is love and forgives all our sins for your sake. Let us never become careless as we confess our sins or grow cold toward the love and mercy of God or despise the sacrifice you made in our behalf. Ever make the eternal redemp redemption you won for us the treasure of our hearts and the desire of our souls. Through the love you have shown us, and the eternal life that is our sure promise, strengthen the new man in us, that we may daily put to death our sinful flesh and evermore live righteously as your true children. You who have redeemed us to God by your own blood, hear our prayers, forgive our sins, and save us from an eternal death. Hear our prayers supply our needs, and comfort us in all things that distress us. O precious Savior, we praise your holy name. And we also join to pray in that name, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in, in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, be with us in truth and love. Please be seated. We close with the hymn, Now Rest Beneath Night Shadows.
Good evening. Um, boy, the sun is just going down, but isn't it nice to end a midweek Lent service without going out in the dark? Oh, by the way, that also says the sermon wasn't too long tonight, right? My friends, it has once again been a privilege and a blessing to be with you um, as we make this spiritual Lenten journey with our Savior. Uh, may his blessings be upon you uh, as we're wrapping up this season of Lent, as we head into Holy Week, and as we ultimately celebrate that victorious day of our Savior's resurrection. Until next time, the Lord's blessings be with you.